Our next keynote presentation is Dean Ingerson from BirdLife Australia. And Dean, I, I said 20 plus years for the other Dean because I thought that was polite, but I'll probably um, say 20, 20 plus years for you with your wealth of experience and knowledge as far as woodland birds and, and birds like the region honey eater. So I won't take any more time, but everyone stretch, uh, put your arms back and uh, we'll hand over this session. The next half goes on, we're gonna talk about our region honey, saving the region honey eater project. Thank you, Dean. Awesome, thank you, Helen. Um, yeah, 20 plus years is about spot on, but um, yeah, also feeling a bit old and freaked out by that thought. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Dean Ingleson. I'm the Woodland Bird Program Leader at BirdLife Australia. Uh, and as part of that role uh, for well over a decade now, I've been the National Regent Honey Eater Recovery Coordinator. <clears throat> um, this is the Regent Honey Eater. Uh, arguably the coolest well probably i think it's probably one of the coolest animals on the planet but mountain pygmy possums go all right too so i'll say this is one of the coolest birds on the planet really distinctive type of plumage um, once you get a good look at them uh, and certainly very charismatic and something that um, you know birders in australia and birders internationally uh, want to lay their eyes on at some stage for those of us working in regent honey eater conservation um, this is the kind of sighting that we want to get uh, and that's adult birds feeding birds that have just fledged uh, and hopped out of the nest. So I'll talk more about that later in my talk, but that's the, the real priority for us at the moment is to improve breeding output of this species. Uh, for those who may not have much experience with Regent honey eaters, whilst they're quite widespread in their distribution, and I've got a slide in a minute that shows that um, they do have some really key species of trees that they rely on uh, for foraging and, and taking nectar out of. So in northeast Victoria, um, mugger ironbark and white box in particular are really important, uh, as well as yellow box uh, during the spring summer period. Um, and then some stringy bark species in Victoria, red, red stringy bark at times, or more traditionally or historically, have been important, but in New South Wales, we have other stringy bark species that are really crucial for the bird. Uh, but they also uh, really rely heavily on the nectar that comes out of a range of mistletoe species. So hem hemiparasitic plants that grow on uh, host eucalypt gum box species. Uh, and I'll talk more about them later on. This is what very typical um, good quality uh, white box woodland looks like for Regent honey eaters. Um, this is a shot of a little, a little bit degraded, but what a remnant mugger ironbark woodland looks like. So when a site like this is flowering, uh, even with a lack of understory, um, they can still occur in you know, re reasonable numbers in a site like this. Uh, and particularly in New South Wales, um, river she oak gallery forest along watercourses uh, have been and still continue to be uh, a really critical um, habitat type for the species to breed in. Uh, we do know that Regent honey eaters have de declined substantially. So that map on the screen there shows um, two colour gradings uh, for the range. The, the brighter colour is what we would call their current range, where we may expect them to turn up. Uh, and that paler colour is what we would call the historic range. So Gould back in the 1800s described breeding Regent honey eaters outside his hotel window in the streets of Adelaide. Uh, they're now extinct from South Australia and, and pretty much gone from Western Victoria as well. They were described as occurring in thousands, in immense numbers. Um, they are quite hard to pin down because of the, the distribution and they are quite literally the needle in the haystack at times. At the moment, our estimate is, you know, probably comfortably under 500 birds nationally, perhaps as low as three or 350 birds. Um, and so at the southern end of the range, the Victorian population size has, has dropped substantially as well. Um, why the drastic decline? Why have they disappeared so much when we consider, uh, you know, many other region, uh, sorry, many other honey eater species, um, you know, are still relatively common. So shorter answer is we, we don't really know exactly what, what has driven Regent honey eaters um, to the point that they are, but we've got some good indicators. Obviously with most 
um, stereotypical conservation stories, loss of habitat is, is the main driver. Uh, and we think they would have preferentially selected those more fertile lowland woodlands, lots of productivity that have now been turned largely into agricultural um, land. Uh, and their lifestyle choice as well, the fact that they are a little bit fussier in terms of the, the, the somewhat more restricted range of species that they do tend to prefer to forage in um, may work against them. They are now with uh, ongoing change in habitat and landscape configuration, increasingly finding themselves having to compete against the native noisy miner, which has expanded um, quite heavily in numbers in particular uh, as a response to agricultural alteration of the landscape. Uh, but these days, even just being at such a low population level is a threat in its own right. So um, historically, 150, 200 years ago, you, you could find flocks of hundreds of regent honey eaters in you know, a single flock. Um, we just don't see that anymore. So it's a notable event for us to find a flock of 30 birds these days. Um, I'll talk more in a minute, uh, but we know that we've got low breeding success these days. And because of the small numbers, it's just there's a real paucity of nests. Uh, but work that we've done in northeast Victoria uh, during captive releases and, and colleagues have done in New South Wales also shows that when they do nest, uh, they are subject to really high levels of predation uh, from mammals and, and other birds. So left to right, we've got interference at a nest from a noisy miner. Um, the middle uh, panel there is a sugar glider about to try and catch uh, a female regent sitting on a nest that then eats its eggs. On the right, we've got a brush-tailed possum uh, that's just emptied a nest. And obviously at the top there, we've got a car carawong, not with a regent in its beak, but reflective of the fact that they get eaten by carawongs, um, ravens, kookaburras and so on uh, as nestlings. Obviously, a really exacerbating threat now, uh, and particularly in recent years, have been bushfires. Um, so that image on the left there shows the footprint of the 2019-2020 bushfires. If we focus on um, you know, where Regent honey eaters have bred for the last 15 years, um, you know, it, it's, it's like chalk and cheese with Dean's talk on pygmy possums where you have discrete locations. Um, Regent honey eaters are so mobile, uh, so widely dispersed, but they do still tend to have focal areas that they do come back to somewhat regularly for breeding. Um, and so these, you know, six broad regions are where we would consider to be, you know, their most regular breeding sites of the last 15 years. If we look at the impact of the fires just on that greater Blue Mountains, central Blue Mountains region on the next slide, um, those orange areas are the, the fire scars, the footprint of the bushfires from 2019-20. During that actual bushfire season, so the fire started in about October, we actually had four locations where Regent honey eaters were, were already breeding or were getting ready to breed as the bushfires arrived. And subsequently, um, you know, the breeding output basically plummeted. Um, so we had no breeding uh, much in that season. Uh, and that came off the back of, um, sorry, following on to that, um, you know, having a season where we had active nests, those fires also burnt sites that were used um, quite heavily in the previous season, particularly that Burragarang Valley um, down in the southern end of that, of that footprint, uh, where we had, um, you know, tens of nests uh, in one location. That has now largely been uh, incinerated, unfortunately. So, you know, we're still monitoring now to see how long that effect lasts uh, of, of losing that site. So at this point, it's where we start to think, do we give up or do we go on and, and push on um, to try and save? And obviously we're very persistent. Um, it, it's a never say give up sort of attitude. And so the sorts of things that we've been doing or that we do do to try and save Regent honey eaters. For a long time, we've had monitoring undertaken as part of monitoring by community members. So search days in May and August each year. And as a result, we've got this trend line that shows that particularly from the mid 1990s, uh, where we used to get quite um, reasonable numbers in a contemporary sense, it does seem to be plateauing a little bit um, these days, uh, albeit well, we're still on a downward trajectory in terms of the species. But um, what we've done in recent years is to, to try and um, target some spring surveys to 
find breeding birds and, and get a better handle on what's causing those declines at the breeding time. So um, the, the difficult bird research group at ANU have been central to this work. So they've done a whole bunch of science behind, um, you know, picking apart where the species occurs based on habitat and a whole other range of other variables. So on the left there, we've got a, a priority range of, of predictability of where the species might turn up. And on the right, we've got a, a snapshot of uh, 1,200 sites across Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland that we, we monitor twice every spring now to try and find breeding birds uh, and also monitor what happens when we do find birds and they are breeding. So Ross Crates has been um, you know, pivotal in doing this work on the wild birds over the last few years. Um, I guess the, the sad part of his results uh, from the 2015 to 2017 period, uh, which was uh, in, in contemporary terms reasonable, I'd have said they were reasonable years. When birds actually nest, their nesting success is down to 31%. So only 31% of nests are succeeding, which is down from 45% in the mid 1990s. And when they succeed, the productivity of individual nests has dropped as well. So on average, a successful nest is only producing 1.6 juveniles per nest. Uh, it peaked at around 2.1 in the 1990s. Interestingly, we do know that once birds get out of the nest, they've got a really high survival rate. Uh, so it does seem that that actual nesting and immediate post nest period is when they're most vulnerable uh, to loss. The other interesting thing is that there does tend to be a, a pool of lone males floating around in the population. Um, so there are more, slightly more males in the population than there are females. Some of the other sorts of things we've been doing uh, for the last decade or so is working hard to um, undertake covenanting on, on key parcels of private land. And as this graph shows, the vast majority of records these days um, still we get on private property, particularly in the central part of the range in New South Wales. So private land conservation is critical to the ongoing survival of Regent honey eaters. So for example, there's two properties in the Capity Valley um, where, we've, um, where we've been helpful in uh, you know, delivering covenants via funding from federal government uh, through con um, conservation incentive schemes. As people that are on this call may have been aware of and may have also participated in, we've been really uh, heavily pushing habitat restoration. So as an example, we did some plantings in conjunction with TFN um, using federal government money a few years ago uh, around the northern edges of the Chiltern Mount Pilot National Park. But one thing we've started to get into in, in bird life in recent years is mistletoe. So most people think of restoration works for plants as stems in ground traditional tree planting, but mistletoe is so crucial to Regent honey eaters. So on the left, there's this species called the long flowered mistletoe in the Lower Hunter Valley. And on the right is needle leaf mistletoe, which occurs in River She Oak Gallery Forest. Both of these, um, Mistletoes, as I said earlier on, are critical in terms of the, the nectar resource that they can provide for the species. Uh, and they can also be used as nesting substrate to hold nests in place. So on the left, there's a bird with a nest in a long flowered mistletoe, or there's enough food in them for them to be able to actually nest successfully. But what we've seen in recent years is a decline in mistletoe, particularly from you know, environmental change. In this case, in the Lower Hunter Valley, um, arson has wiped out large swathes of um, habitat in, in um, a really key remnant uh, within that Lower Hunter Valley region. And the fires have been so intense and so large that it's actually killed all of the mistletoe in the host trees. And, and that mistletoe is critical to the species breeding when they turn up in this, this location. So rather than wait for nature to take its course, um, we've actually decided that we'd go and collect some mistletoe. Um, you've got to pick it when it's ripe, you get it nice and sticky, and then you find yourself a friendly and happy arborist who climbs up into a tree and literally squeezes the fruit out of the, out of the fruit capsule and wipes it on appropriate sized um, branchlets through the canopy of the tree uh, to try and put um, you know, this critical resource back into the, the environment. So 
all we're trying to do here is speed up the recovery process. So rather than wait and rely on mistletoe birds to do this job, which would take decades, uh, we're trying to give, we're, we're trialing, trying to give this um, habitat a bit of a kickstart. So at the moment we've planted about a thousand seeds uh, in this patch of forest, and we've got some money to do some more of this over the next 12 months. So for this species, fire is bad news. Um, I should, sorry, I should acknowledge that this has been a really fantastic collaboration uh, with the Minda River Local Aboriginal Land Council as well. It's been a fantastic partnership and we've been doing that work on, on their country, uh, which has been amazing. The other thing that mistletoe don't like is drought. So in the Capity Valley, uh, the drought uh, leading up to uh, those bushfires a couple of years ago, um, we've seen literally hundreds of mistletoes in individual trees just turn up their heels and die. Uh, in, in some instances, we've had host trees um, die as well. Uh, but in many instances, we've got still live, healthy host trees, but the mistletoe have been put through so much stress uh, that, they've, um, that they've died. And again, this is a nectar resource during the critical breeding season, and it's also a, a, a valuable nesting substrate. Uh, so once again, we, we've collected fruit um, as fruit has been happening on these trees in, in summer uh, and in a, a small patch of, of um, habitat along the Capity River, uh, which arguably, and, and certainly 20 years ago, you would have easily said this was the most important um, breeding site on the planet for the bird. Uh, we've got stretches of col um, you know, kilometres of habitat uh, uh, riverfront now, which is unusable uh, at the moment. So we're trying to restore little patches of this to create some more breeding habitat back in that key part of the range. Subsequent to that, one thing that we, we're always trying to question is what whether we're doing the right things and whether we're doing enough of the right things. So again, with some federal government bushfire recovery funding in the last 12 months, um, BirdLife and the recovery team and ANU, we've all collaborated and done a population viability analysis. Um, I haven't put the really depressing slides up because I don't think anyone needs that at nine o'clock at night, but at the moment, the trajectory for the bird is not good. But what we've got is at least one model that shows a potential way out uh, for this bird. And the critical things that we need to try and do is continue captive breeding and releases, but increase the size of those releases. And importantly for birds in the wild, um, both wild birds and captive release birds out in the wild, is increase that nest productivity back up to more nests succeeding, but also more birds being produced per nest. And under this one model in particular, uh, with a really solid 10 year effort, there's the potential there that we could get a self-sustaining population happening again. So just on that, I mean, the recovery team was somewhat um, uh, visionary in taking birds into captivity nearly 30 years ago uh, before we got to this dire situation. So there's a well-established captive population already. Um, and as many would know, we've already been doing captive releases. Uh, so for you know 2008 to 2017, we had a series of releases in Northeast Victoria. Uh, but in recent years, we've tried uh, in 2019 to do one in New South Wales, which we had to cancel because of the drought. But last year we did do a release in New South Wales for the first time, um, trying to get some birds back into the core part of the range where the bulk of the wild population still exists. So the PVA, we, we've been doing the right thing in this instance, we just need to ramp up the size and, and the frequency with which we do these releases. So as an example, last year um, we released 20 birds uh, in the middle of a COVID pandemic uh, in the lower Hunter Valley to the site um, that was flowering really heavily and where birds have, have turned up previously. Um, and then we monitored them for 12 weeks. And I won't go into heaps of detail because there's other things I, I want to present on. Um, I could literally talk for an hour and a half on releases only. Um, but it was a very different world, as I said. Um, you know, wearing the, the Beastie Boys outfits covered up so that we didn't spread um, germs to each other in this COVID world. Um, but the landscape was really interesting that you know, the birds are in and around the northern edge of the Blue Mountains. So some pretty big days for field work for the guys that, that were tracking these birds post-release. 
Um, to give an idea of, of you know, what you get out of radio tracking uh, individuals around the landscape after the monitoring period, for example, this was the July tracking data uh, and the yellow pin there in the middle, middle called meet here was the property where we released the birds. Uh, and you can see there's quite a spread uh, east and west in particular uh, that these birds have, have covered. So it's probably 30 to 40 kilometres east to west there that over a month the birds have dispersed across. So they, they certainly get on with using the landscape when, once they're out. That site in particular was really um, you know, wonderful for me, having been involved with the recovery program for a long time. To do captive breeding, you've got to take birds into to captivity. So we call them founders. So in 2012, we'd collected five founders from this property when a flock of 50 Regent honey eaters had turned up. Uh, so it was wonderful uh, eight years later to, to go and put a flock back into the wild. Um, unfortunately, the results last year weren't as good as we'd hoped uh, with, with some higher mortality than we'd anticipated. Um, but we're trying to put those learnings into place for the next release that we're hoping to do in the next 12 months or so. But getting back to the PVA, one thing that we're focusing a lot of attention on now is trying to improve that breeding success once birds are in the wild. Um, either for the captive release birds once they're out or particularly for the, the wild birds. So again, since 2016, when we first uncovered this, um, trying to get nest collars around trees, trying different uh, installation methods, putting cameras on nests just to evaluate you know, what we're doing, whether it's working, uh, but also what are the ongoing um, you know, issues around the breeding success for this bird. And because noisy miners are such an issue, um, we've been doing some quite targeted, um, but also you know, heavily scrutinised and, and scientifically uh, rigorous noisy miner removals to evaluate the effectiveness uh, as a, of that as a management tool. As an example, some of the noisy miner work we've been doing uh, has been what we would call response controls. So for this site in the Caperty Valley, for example, we had birds turn up to breed uh, in 2017 and at the time there were some noisy miners in and around this this area where the birds were breeding. We had a contractor in there within about four or five days and we cleared out every noisy miner we could find within a couple of k radius uh, and subsequently I think off the top of my head we had 11 sorry nine successful nests produced about 15 fledglings out of that site that year. Uh, so a really um, instantaneous benefit uh, for the productivity of that bird in the wild. Uh, and yeah, as a result, we get wonderful images like this where we have birds uh, feeding fledglings that have come out of the nests where we've done that control work. Um, using funding through uh, the Northeast CMA, uh, similar to what's been discussed tonight, we've been trialling this around Chiltern as well. Because we've done captive releases here, for a decade or more, we, we get a really good handle on the sites of, sort of sites that this species utilises. Um, so in the northeast section, south of the freeway, if that makes sense. Uh, so the, the Chilton, sorry, Barnawatha Depot Road um, kind of region of the park for those who know um, the, the park. Uh, we've been trialling some removals for the last few years. Um, and on the right there, I've got some data which has been collected from you know, a number of controls that either BirdLife or ANU have been involved in, where you know, from left to right there, noisy minor densities on the left bar is pre-cull, uh, pre and then noisy minor densities thereafter once we've culled you know, at, at time intervals. And in some instances, you know, we, we don't get noisy minor levels back to below what we would call a, a critical number. Um, but encouragingly, last year, for example, on a private property where we'd done this work in, in Chilton, uh, we saw um, a couple of captive bred birds from 2017 successfully nest uh, and fledge a, a, a triplet um, group of birds, which is quite unusual. Um, normally, you, you do well to get two birds out of a nest, but uh, to have triplets out of that nest was, was really fantastic. Uh, and I should say this is a contemporary action happening as, as we speak. So we've got some birds breeding in New South Wales uh, at the moment, uh, and we're doing some of this work in and around those nesting aggregations as well. Um, and COVID willing, we'll also continue that work around Chilton uh, in the coming months too. And I'll just finalise, because I think I've pretty much used up my time. 
um, by just saying that there is a, you know, a massive suite of recovery partners involved in all of this work. Uh, it is an enormous undertaking. I've skimmed over so much stuff that we do um, just because of time constraints. Um, but yeah, I, I really want to acknowledge everyone on that screen for playing their part in all sorts of things for Regent Honey Eater Conservation. Thank you, Dean, and well done. Um, that is a great story. We didn't quite get to hear the songs, but maybe later. <laughs> um, thank you. you. You've helped us catch up a little bit on time. Really informative, heaps of information. We have a couple of questions or one question to start with. Can you touch on the potential for satellite tracking to fill the key knowledge gaps of where regions go in our northeast Victorian summer, for example? Yeah, absolutely. And that was um, John, that was one slide that I did take out to try and make sure I fitted my time slot tonight. But um, as people may know, for all of the captive releases that we've done, and even for some wild birds, we've done very um, what what these days is probably somewhat old school monitoring, where we stick a, a a radio transmitter on a bird with a backpack harness, and we physically track it around the landscape with handheld aerials. Um, there's a company in America that has developed satellite tracking technology to a size that is now small enough to fit on a bird like a Regent honey eater. Um, so just over my shoulder, if I point in front of the Lego boxes, which is a bit embarrassing, but I've got a stack of 10 satellite transmitters sitting there um, ready to deploy on Regent honey eaters in the wild. Um, so the idea with this technology is that the transmitters are now small enough to fit on big male Regent honey eaters. We have a period, particularly from probably December, January through until about April every year where Regent honey eaters effectively vanish off the face of the planet on us. We can't find where they go and we have an inkling, but we don't know for certain other than a handful of sightings. So what we want to do is get these satellite transmitters onto the birds. They are um, solar powered, so they have an inbuilt battery. They also have solar panels that recharge them. Notionally, they can work for 18 months to two years once deployed. Uh, and we're hoping uh, that at some stage in the next six months or so, we're going to get some of these transmitters out on, on birds. It's really horrendous field work where I put the transmitter on the bird and then I sit at my desk and I just download data out of the internet uh, and it shows me where the species is moving through the landscape. So. Uh, we're really hoping that that's going to help unpack some of this movement information for the species. There may be sites they go to that we don't even look at at the moment from a management perspective. Um, so yeah, really exciting time um, to be able to get on and, and trial that stuff in the next little while. Thank you, Dean. And we have one more question about uh, what can we do to help with the conservation? And uh, yeah, then I've got one more question and then we'll transfer over. Uh, look, what you can do to help with conservation is obviously support organisations like BirdLife Australia um, who are you know, doing this work in the field. So, um, you know, th there's a few ways you can do that. You can support us with your, with your time if you want to volunteer to help with bird surveys, with habitat restoration works that we do, uh, with getting involved in once COVID's over and we get another release happening, you know, if you want to come and volunteer with field work on work like that, we're always open to having people involved. Um, if you want to volunteer your voice, we, we have campaigns that we run through BirdLife Australia uh, around habitat protection and, and preservation. So um, that Burragarang Valley, Warragamba Dam is an issue in New South Wales that's quite political, but sites like those are going to be critical for the survival of the species in in, in the long term um, and then at the risk of sounding like a, a hustler you know if people uh, <laughs> want to sign up as members or, or support us financially um, but you know the suite of organizations here as well I'm, I'm talking very selfishly about birdlife australia but involvement through NECMA's program for bush for birds and others that you know if, if you've got property that you're happy to have restoration work done on noisy minor management potentially. There's so many ways that people can get involved. There's extension materials on BirdLife's website that, that people can get access to, which has suggestions in there on what to do. Thank you, Dean. We had one last question. It was from Mark, who's speaking next, but um, how critical is the captive component to the recovery of the species into the future? Well, according to the PVA, it's one of the two most important things we can do and get right. Um, yep. 
I think it's important to point out that what you know the 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 PVA. I'm slightly biased because I've helped write it, even though I didn't help you know run it. Um, you know, all of the work that we're doing is the right stuff to be doing. It's the habitat restoration. It's the control of the competitors. It's sorting out the breeding success. Uh, I think we'd be in a much worse situation now than we are if we hadn't been doing that work. Um, but you know, for the captive component, um, you know, it, it is critical for the on long-term survival of the species, um, but we've got to tweak it. We, we've got to do more. Um, we've got to get more birds out there more regularly. And then again, as I said, once they're out, improving that, that post-release breeding success of those birds, but also the breeding success of wild birds. Thank you, Dean. And for my ignorance, PVA stands for? Sorry, Population Viability Analysis. So it's a, it's a modelling exercise to <laughs> yep. look at trajectory of the bird. Great. Look, thank you very, very much for your time, Dean. If anyone has any other questions, pop them in the chat. We'll try and answer them. We have, we're have we not too late. We're, we've got about 10 minutes to go, everyone, if you can hang in there. We've got uh, Mark Kens from North East CMA is going to give us a brief outline of the Bush for Birds project. And we've also got Amelia Halton from Trust for Nature who'll talk after Mark to um, touch on the Covenant, Covenant program that we're running. So I'll hand over straight to Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Helen. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of the Bush of Birds program. Um, I'm Mark Hans, Senior Biodiversity Project Officer with, with North East CMA. Um, what I want to sort of reiterate and support the comments that uh, and the amount of information that the Dean has presented this evening is that, you know, outside of the research um, and the on-ground works, um, the recovery of these species take specific people to to make them a success and as you probably heard tonight both Dean Hines and, and Dean Ingerson are both very passionate about what they do um, and without those sort of people and without the accumulation of knowledge over many many years um, the recovery of these species is probably unlikely to happen and it's usually driven by um, small dedicated teams um, I know Dean Hines and Dean Ingerson have dedicated their lives their professional lives to uh, species recovery. So it's extremely important that um, we have the right people working on these projects and that's what we've got in this place at the moment. So um, the Bush for Birds program, which is uh, a significant investment from the Australian government, is one of a number of investments um, and it sort of reiterates the importance and how serious the Australian government take takes the recovery of these species. So um, the Bush for Birds program is, is rolled out and delivered by the Northeast CMA in the Northeast region. Um, and essentially what it does, it, it supports um, recovery actions that have been outlined, uh, as Phil mentioned earlier, uh, the recovery plans that are uh, issued and endorsed at a at national level. Um, and investments come from both Australian government and from the state governments and extremely important to ongoing work to recover these species. If you can just go to the next slide, please. So as an example of, of um, working on the, the recovery actions for the region honey in particular, um, the Bush for Birds program works at one end of the stick of the recovery stick. So, you know, Dean touched on some of the uh, research, the genetic work, some of the song work, um, the on-ground actions from a, a short-term perspective dealing with noisy miners and also the captive components. So that's probably one end of the stick. And then you've got the long-term aspects associated with restoring habitat, which is you know, critical to dealing with some of the threatened processes. The Bush for Birds program is a landscape scale habitat restoration um, program for the, the region of Honeyeater and Swift Parrot. Um, so by default, the swift parrot benefits from these actions because it utilises the same habitat from a foraging perspective, um, which we can probably say um, in, in general um, habitat terms, it's the inland slopes that supports uh, white box, yellow box um, and mugga ironbark um, woodlands in northeast Victoria, which obviously extend into New South Wales. And these are a winter spring flowering eucalypts that are extremely important for foraging and also um, proximity to providing food and resources during the breeding season. Um, so they're supported by Australian Government's land, National Land Care Program, addressing um, the key threats to the region honey eater. The key project activities are around protecting and enhancing remnant vegetation, which is probably one of the priority actions that we need to look at. We have so many sites that have remnant vegetation on private land, and as Dean mentioned before, um, the real challenge is to protect these habitats on private landscapes. That's where the future and the recovery of these species really sits at this point in time. We have quite an extensive reserve system, um, but unfortunately the reserve system is not 
um, designed or, or um, specifically put in place to benefit one particular species. And obviously, um, the fragmentation and, and some of the threatening processes that um, the region honey has faced over the, the last century um, you know, have been outside of those reserve systems. So therefore, you know, the recovery of these species is reliant on other um, design aspects to the recovery. And every recovery program um, is different. You know, whilst some of the actions benefit other species, um, essentially, you know, we have to design them specifically for the species. And if we have um, knock-on effects that are beneficial, then that's an added bonus. Um, and, you know, these, these things take a long time to, to roll out over a period of time. So additional activities include creating new habitats through revegetation. So that's you know, standard reveg, putting in plant species. Um, in this particular case, we try and target those canopy tree species that Dean mentioned before that are critical uh, feed food resources for the region honey eaters. So white box, yellow box, uh, even some red box to a certain extent, mugger ironbark, which are all those grassy woodland species that have historically been um, cleared or fragmented um, last century. Um, and we're now seeing the, the long-term knock-on effects um, to the region honey population over a period of time. We also look at uh, augmenting and restoring uh, habitats through controlling um, introduced weeds uh, and also ecological thinning. So weed control is important because we look at replacing some of those understory species um, that, that are important for soil health, uh, nitrogen fixation, uh, but also providing habitat for a range of other woodland birds that help count counter that competition exclusion uh, threatening process that noisy miners um, have have put pressure on over a number of years because of the change in the landscape. Um, part of the program also looks at control of overabundant noisy miners, um, which BirdLife Australia are involved in, which is fantastic, um, and also community engagement education throughout the landscape because, you know, success of this program really is uh, engaging at a landholder private uh, level. Um, and on an individual property basis to basically get to hit the targets that we're looking for throughout this program. It is an ambitious program um, and it's really designed around short and medium term outcomes between uh, 2018 when the program started um, to June 2023. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're setting up long term benefits to the species. So 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years down the track when we expect to see the benefits of a lot of this work and investment um, come come to fruition with increased amount of habitat available for these, particularly for the region honey eater, um, and as an added benefit to the swift parrot as well. Next slide, please. Um, so the key outputs under this program this stage uh, from the investment from the Australian government, we're looking at just over uh, a thousand uh, hectares of, of habitat under management. Um, one of the key processes that we use with uh, private landholders is to establish 10-year management agreements um, to tie in um, the benefits to the activities they undertake uh, with respect to habitat restoration and to protect that investment uh, for a period of 10 years. Um, we've got targets of 890 hectares of weed removal, uh, pest control across 2,000 hectares of, of um, noisy minor uh, um, uh, habitat in, inhabited by noisy miners on the edge and within Chilton Mount Pilot National Park. Um, as Dean alluded to, we, we've undertaken some of that work to date um, and obviously have plans um, in and around COVID restrictions to complete and continue that work um, in the next couple of months as well and, and next year. Uh, we've got a target of 185 hectares of, of uh, revegetation through planting, direct seeding and other regenerative techniques um, and also to deliver um, in excess of 25 community training workshops and field days throughout that five year period. Um, all of those targets this stage, with the exception of perhaps noisy minor control, which we know is going to be delivered over the next two years, um, we've met or exceeded to date, um, which is extremely exciting. So commitments we've got set up in land management agreements with private landholders. Um, and of course, those leverage benefits benefit a range of other species that we're familiar with. And, and you know, Dean, as the woodland um, uh, team leader for BirdLife Australia, not only works with region honey eaters, but across a range of other species throughout the inland slopes um, and a couple of species that we've got images down the bottom there, which happen to be Dean Ingerson's photos. <laughs> Uh, bushstone curlews, diamond firetails, grey crown babblers, turquoise parrots, uh, brown tree creepers, um, and obviously mugger ironbark. And, and they're species that we can also use as surrogates to determine whether the actions and the restoration of those habitats are actually being successful because we expect to see uh, increase in numbers of those other birds that um, will benefit from these sort of activities. Next slide, please. So these sort of programs, um, 
are not successful without key partners and stakeholders. So, you know, whilst uh, North East CMA are delivering this project, we have key partners with Trust for Nature. Um, we'll have Amelia Horton, who will talk about the importance of remnant protection and covenants very shortly. BirdLife Australia, who are delivering key aspects around noisy minor control, um, but also doing key monitoring within the core habitat areas in Chiltern Mount Pilot National Park, and also the northern end of the Warby Ranges, where we know the birds frequent and feed um, on a regular basis throughout um, a number of seasons. Parks Victoria, we have a couple of um, uh, public land sites we're also managing. Um, DELP or Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning are key stakeholders in this program. They have uh, state-based investments around some of the reintroduction programs that have historically occurred, um, but they're also part of our um, Brains Trust and rolling out and um, operational activities associated with this program, so they're key partners in that. Swamps, Rivers and Ranges, a community group that we've engaged to undertake um, uh, bird monitoring in and outside of the core areas. So to look at the success of other landscapes that are not normally monitored. Um, so it's a citizen science volunteer based um, program uh, targeting core areas that are uh, modelled for region honeyers as well as other sites that historic, they used to historically occur. Uh, traditional owners are also being engaged to do on ground works and also we have an expressive interest program at the moment looking at getting traditional owners back on country and working on um, the Bush for Birds program, um, delivering some of those on ground actions. And critical are the local land care networks who uh, have helped in the design of this overall program initially in 2018, but also delivering um, key components of um, education and training, um, have an existing community network and, and many, many years of, of expertise in actually restoring a habitat on the ground. Uh, and without their extensive knowledge, um, a lot of these activities would just would not be possible from a, a private land habitat perspective. Next, next slide, please. So just as an overview, um, the program covers approximately a third of the northeast catchment management area. Um, as you can see, it might be a little difficult to see, there's a, a yellow line that sort of encompasses a large area um, of the Ovens uh, River catchment, uh, Chiltern Mount Pilot National Park, and some of the uh, uh, Kiwa Valley and Yakandana Creek um, valleys, and also a small section up on Telgano, moving across to, I don't even think what that national park is called. Um, but essentially what it mimics or models are the, the key habitat types that either still currently exist or historically exist, existed um, that contain those target canopy tree species that we've been working on over the last three years. Um, and certainly the sort of targeted areas that Dean has talked about that are critical habitat areas for the region honey at this point in time. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm just, just leading into um, a, a brief um, presentation of my Trust for Nature. Um, just to focus on this program is really priority number one is to protect and enhance existing vegetation. And um, that in itself is a, a quite an important process and Trust for Nature have been working on that uh, very aspect for many, many years. Um, so I will hand over to Amelia Horton from Trust for Nature. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Go Amelia. <laughs> Lucky Thanks last, Amelia. Very much, Mark. <laughs> Thanks. Hi everyone, it's lovely to see you. Uh, my name's Amelia and I work with Trust for Nature in the North East region. Uh, thanks, Di. Thanks very much. I've just got two slides and my photos definitely aren't as fancy as some of the others. Um, so Trust for Nature is a not-for-profit and we're a statutory entity set up by the Victorian Conservation Trust Act and we've been around since the early 70s. Um, and one of the the main things that we do is um, provide conservation covenants to protect high value nature on private land. And that is really important because 62% of land in Victoria is actually privately owned. Um, so to date, we've been able to secure 1400 covenants and that is protecting over 65,000 hectares across Victoria. Uh, we also manage a number of reserves across the state, which is adding an additional 36,000 hectares, um, which all rolled up um, contributes to the National Reserve System. Uh, next slide, please, Di. So 
We have been working with NECMA on a range of projects in the northeast, um, particularly around bushfire recovery and also the Bush for Birds project. So this has been a fantastic project for us because it has allowed us to do a lot of work um, around the Chiltern Mount Pilot region, which we otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. So through this project, uh, we've been able to establish 27 land management agreements, and that is essentially protecting over 500 hectares um, of habitat on private land under 10 year management agreements and 220 hectares of habitat for the Regent Honey Eater, uh, which are protected under conservation covenants. And what that essentially means is that those areas that are now protected thanks to this project, um, they'll provide um, critical habitat for the Regent Honey Eaters into the future. And uh, I should have mentioned it before, but sitting alongside our covenanting program, we have our stewardship program. So that really enables Trust for Nature staff to be able to go out into the field um, to work with landholders to monitor these sites that they're essentially protecting and we can uh, work with landholders and provide management advice and be able to find ongoing funding for activities like weed control. So really um, that's one of the benefits of utilising conservation covenants is it, is it means that we're actually able to provide um, a greater level of support to landholders into the future and secure really valuable sites forever. Um, under this project, we've also been able to undertake some fencing, which is critical, and uh, 75 hectares of ecological thinning, which will go towards improving the habitat um, and hopefully allow some of those um, important tree species that Dean and Mark have mentioned to grow up and become beautiful old um, hollow bearing trees like this one that's on this slide now. Um, we've also been able to undertake 300 hectares of weed control with landholders and 40 hectares of revegetation. Um, and these are some of the, uh, the landholders who have been able to covenant their properties thanks to um, this project. So yeah, it's been a really great opportunity um, and these landholders are doing a lot in terms of protecting um, habitat for the region honey eater into the future. Thanks, Helen. Thank you, Amelia. That's a great finishing shot to um, show the people behind some of the areas that are managed. So I really value that. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Um, if you have um, any last minute questions, you can pop them up in the chat. We'd like, I'd need to give a plug um, and a thank you to the North East CMA staff who've made this night happen. So thank you, Di, Phil, Mark and Marina in particular. Thank you to all of the presenters and our partners. We've got lots of partners I know on the chat who, um, uh, who've put questions in. So thank you to the partners, um, but also, yeah, that, that you can just see the huge range of enthusiastic people who work on threatened species in this landscape and they're all sitting a lot of them that we work with are sitting in here tonight listening so i want to thank everyone we've also done some threatened species fact sheets so everyone who registered through eventbrite i think got an email today so thank you to the team from necma who made them happen there's more information on our website and there's lots of information on our partners website so I think that's the end of the night. We want to wrap up now. Uh, really big thank you to our keynote speakers, the two, the Dean duo, as I'm calling them today. Um, it's a real privilege to work with people with so much experience. If you've got any feedback or comments, please throw them in the chat. Uh, stay safe. Um, enjoy, hopefully, a bit of easing of restrictions for everybody. And um, thank you for participating. We'll stay a few online. I've got. There's a hand up somewhere. I've got to just check that. If there's any last minute yell out questions, let us know, but uh, any comments or feedback in the chat too, thanks. We'll stay online for a few minutes if anyone wants to speak to us. Thanks everyone, good night. Helen, we have a hand up from uh, Gay yes, and Peter. Hand up. 
Sorry, thank you, Marina. Um, Gay, I haven't got my right screen on. Can we, uh, we might need to unmute them. Yes, Gay and Peter. Can someone be clever and unmute them so they can speak? <laughs> should have done that, Hella. They should okay. be able to, if they can unmute their mic. Is there only the one hand up? Like, yes. I believe so. Yeah. It might be. I'll just check that. Um, We'll just stay online for a moment. Thanks everyone else for coming and the presentations will be on, um, we'll put them up on or link up uh, to the website, I think. Uh, thank you for that. And any emails, you've all got our email, please let us know if there's any follow up you'd like. Thanks everyone. Good evening. <laughs>